This video is about bonding in metals, semiconductors, and the band theory of solids. This comes from the beginning of chapter 12 in the textbook Chemistry, the Science and Context by Gilbert, Kearse, Foster, and Davies, third edition. So let's get started. So just a quick review of the metallic bonding model. So let's talk about metallic bonds and conduction bands. So we're going to start off with a good metal, like copper. So remember that we know a couple of things about copper. So copper has this electron configuration, the same electron configuration of, as argon, 3d10, 4s1. So because the n equal 4 shell is furthest from the nucleus, that is our one and only valence electron. Notice that uh, copper has this sort of unusual electron configuration. We might have predicted it to be 3d9, 4s2, but we've learned that sometimes in nature, atoms prefer to have filled or half-filled subshells if possible. So copper can do that by taking an electron out of the s and sticking it in the d instead. So this is the electron configuration. So the n equal 4 shell, we know that the principal quantum number tells us how far away from the nucleus you are. So this is the outer electron. And the outer electron is the, the business electron. That's the one that will first come in contact with other atoms, and so that's where all bonding and reaction takes place on the outside of the atom. So there's a little sketch of what that might look like. Here's the um, electron in some orbit or some shell. We're going to call it the 4s shell. And here are the le rest of the electrons in the nucleus of the copper atom there. Another thing that we know about copper is it has an electronegativity of 1.8. This is on the uh, scale by Allred and Rockow, which is a little bit different than the Pauling scale. So there are different ways of measuring electronegativity. But the important thing is it's much less than fluorine's electronegativity of 4.1 and a lot more than, well, like somewhat more than the electronegativity of an atom like sodium, which has an electronegativity of about uh, 1.0 on that scale. So this is kind of in between, which means it doesn't hold very tightly to its electrons but holds on moderately tightly, so not super tight. So it's willing to give those electrons up, and if another electron were to drift into its valence shell, it would not hold on to that electron very tightly. So let's look at our typical model for metallic bonding. So in metallic bonding, unlike covalent bonding, where electrons are shared tightly between two atoms, since the metal atoms don't hold on tightly to their electrons, they're going to agree to some kind of share them loosely. So we get this picture, sometimes called the electron C picture of metallic bonding. So here are the copper atoms nicely arranged in a crystal lattice. And what we've done is we've taken their one valence electron, we're sharing it between all of the other copper atoms. So what's left behind is a copper core that has a plus one charge. So what holds this thing together? Well, the attraction between the little positively charged islands and this sea of electrons. And as we've seen, this can explain a lot of the properties of metals because the electrons, not being held tightly to any one atom, are relatively free to move around in this space. So the model goes. So we can explain properties like electrical conductivity because electrons flow in one side, can easily move around and flow out the other side. We could even imagine that we could explain why it is that the resistance of most metals to flow of electrons tends to increase as the temperature increases. So as the temperature goes up, we imagine these islands start rocking around, moving a little bit more because of thermal motion, thermal agitation. So that creates a little bit more friction. The electrons kind of moving through here see these positively charged ions, and they, they tend to get stuck a little bit more. So that impedes their, their flow through this metal. So that might be how we explain electrical conductivity and resistance temperature effects using this electron C model. But it turns out that this electron C model can't explain all the properties you might want to with regard to electrical conductivity and other properties of metals. So we need a more sophisticated model. And our more sophisticated model is based on quantum mechanics. And so quantum mechanics is always a little bit abstract, so we'll try and go through it a little bit. So this version of quantum mechanics applied to bonding in metals is called band theory. You'll see why that is in a little bit. So again, this is based kind of on quantum molecular orbital theory. So you might want to go back and review molecular orbital theory just to remind yourself what that's about. But let's imagine that we're going to make a molecule out of two copper atoms, so Cu2. So here's a little picture showing that happen. The two copper atoms come together, their 4s orbitals overlap, and uh, they're going to agree to share a pair of electrons between those two orbitals. So how we show that in pictures is like this. So I'm going to draw an energy axis right here. So this is energy increasing as we go up. 
One thing we know about quantum mechanics is that energies are quantized, which means they can only take on fixed values. So if we have a lone copper atom with its one 4s electron, that electron is going to have a certain amount of energy, represented by this line right here. So if we have another copper atom that's far away, it's also going to have a 4s, electron, a 4s orbital with a 1s electron in that orbital. Now, As we bring those two copper atoms together, what we imagine happening is that we can take these two orbitals and create a new molecular orbital that now, instead of being isolated on one atom or the other, sort of spans the whole molecule, so it encompasses, encases that whole molecule. So when we take two atomic orbitals and we combine them, we're going to get two orbitals back out. So here's one of them, and you see that it's lower in energy. So we call that the bonding orbital. Since it's lower in energy, we're going to put the two electrons that each copper atom has in that lower energy orbital first. That follows the off-bow principle, you might remember. We fill from low energy to high energy. This orbital, when we overlap two s orbitals, has something that we call sigma symmetry. You might want to go back and look at what that is. And so we call this a sigma bonding orbital. This orbital up here, denoted sigma star, is an anti-bonding orbital. And notice that it's unoccupied. We don't have any electrons up there right now. Here's a molecular orbital theory in pictures showing what's going on. So here's a copper atom. We'll call that copper atom A. And uh, that copper atom has a 4s orbital. So 4s orbitals look like spheres. So there's a sphere. There's where the nucleus of the, carbon at the copper atom would be right there. And there's that one valence electron. Same thing for another copper atom, atom B. And so what we're going to do is we're going to combine these two orbitals. Now orbitals, you know, we think they're real, but it's part of this quantum model. They're really just mathematical functions. But they're very important mathematical functions because if you know that function, you can use it to predict the probable location of an electron. So if we've got an electron that's described by this 4s mathematical function, we can say with reasonable certainty that it's somewhere inside this sphere, 99.9% .9 of the time or something like that. So since these 4s functions are functions, we can do things with functions that you can do with all kinds of functions. We can add them, we can subtract them, multiply them, and divide them. So what we're going to do in molecular orbital theory is combine them. So we're going to add and subtract them in different ways. So we're going to create a new wave function. So that's the symbol for a wave function. It looks kind of like a pitchfork. That's the Greek letter psi. We're going to combine these two mathematical functions. A and B. And what we get is a new mathematical function that looks like this. So we sort of fuse these two 4s orbitals to make a big orbital that looks like kind of a football. And then the two electrons they're sharing are free to room around anywhere they want inside this orbital, more or less. Notice that now they have to have opposite spin, one up and one down, according to the Pauli principle. So another way that we could combine these orbitals instead of adding them is to subtract them. Now since these are mathematical functions, they have mathematical signs, positive and negative. Just like a sine function will have a portion where it's positive and a portion where it's negative. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract these two orbitals. Now that's the same as taking this orbital right here and multiplying it by minus 1. When we do, we change the sign. Now we've got something that's positive and we're adding something to it that's negative. So somewhere in between, we go from positive to negative, and that means we have to cross zero. So the new function is going to look kind of like this. There are two lobes, one that has a positive mathematical sign, so I put a plus sign here and I shaded it in blue, and one that has a negative mathematical sign, so I've shaded that in red. Remember, these pluses and minuses don't mean charge. They mean mathematical sign of the function, you know, positive or negative. So in between where you cross zero, we call that a node. That's a region of zero probability. So there's no chance of finding either of those two electrons there. So that means there's no chance that you build up electron density in between the two atoms. So that is not contributing towards bonding because there's a place where you don't share the electrons. That's why we call it an anti-bonding orbital. And that orbital, it turns out, is higher in energy. So there's a brief review of molecular orbital theory. Now let's begin thinking about how it applies to metals. And so we'll look at that in the next part of this video.